Anyway, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and I'd like to thank GDQ for having us back this year. Um, it's kind of a fun, exciting event. My name is Matthew West. Um, I am originally from New Jersey, but I currently reside in New Orleans. I came here today because I wanted to share with you guys my experience as a field worker um, with Doctors Without Borders. I spent many years working in the field um, with Doctors Without Borders. Um, before we get started, though, I'd like to start with a brief two-minute video. This video does a much better job than I can in, a, in two minutes explaining exactly what Doctors Without Borders is, what we do, what we stand for. So, without further ado... Doctors Without Borders, also known internationally by our French name, Médecins Sans Frontières, or MSF, is an independent medical humanitarian organization. Founded in 1971, MSF won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1999. Today we have some 33,000 staff on the ground in roughly 70 countries. We work in communities affected by war, natural disasters, disease outbreaks, chronic neglect, and other crises. We treat people based on medical needs alone, regardless of race, religion, or political affiliation. On any given day, we assist patients who have no other access to healthcare services. Our medical teams can offer critical services such as surgery, maternal care, vaccinations, and mental health counseling. When people are forced from their homes, we focus on treating illnesses and injuries. We work to prevent disease outbreaks in refugee camps and other settlements. We treat malnutrition and the consequences of sexual violence. Our advocacy message is always the same. People at risk should be able to access health care, and medical workers, even in active conflict zones, must be able to provide it. And life-saving medicines and vaccines must be affordable and accessible to the people who need them most. The ongoing support of our donors, together with the profound commitment of our aid workers, will allow MSF to provide independent and impartial assistance to people in crises for a long time to come. We know that the future holds many challenges for people around the world, but we also know what's possible when we go where we're most needed with the materials we need to deliver life-saving medical care. Okay, so again, Doctors Without Borders is an independent, impartial, and neutral humanitarian actor. Um, first, I'd like to say, uh, as the video noted, we are internationally known by our French acronym and French name, Médecins Sans Frontières, or MSF. So for the remainder of this presentation, I will, be, I will refer to the organization as MSF. Um, I'd like to first start by saying that I'm not a doctor, okay? I have no medical training whatsoever. Um, I did, I, I worked for MSF for about six years. I did nine missions in these nine countries as a logistician. So I did logistics and operations for the organization. So what is logistics exactly? Um, logisticians or logs are kind of typically the first ones on the ground, the ones setting projects up, keeping projects running, providing all the support for the medical teams, kind of the backbone of the entire organization. So I did things like supply, procurement, power, water, construction, vehicles, IT, this sort of thing. Um, I can recall working in Nigeria with an orthopedic surgeon who on a daily basis was mending people's broken bones and one morning he asked me how to work a toaster. And, and I actually got to say, you don't have to be a surgeon to work a toaster. Um, so it takes all types is the, is the bottom line. Um, I come from a very broad technical background. I spent many years building swimming pools. I used to build houses. I worked as an electrician. I was in the solar electric industry for a while. Um, I was a diesel mechanic for a while. And I even managed to get a couple university degrees. In 2009, I was talking with a friend of mine, um, sort of ex telling him that I was interested in doing some sort of international humanitarian work. He 
he thought he told me to look into MSF, which I thought was kind of a crazy idea because I'm not a doctor. I have no medical training. He said, no, no, they're looking for people just like you with your, your skill set. So I signed up for an information session um, that was uh, coming up in the coming months in Los Angeles, where I was living at the time. And um, so I went to this info session, and two weeks prior, the earthquake in Haiti happened. And I was um, sitting in the audience listening to this MSF aid worker talk about MSF's response to the Haitian earthquake and how within hours uh, MSF had planes full of supply and, and aid workers on their way to Haiti within hours after the earthquake. So I was totally inspired. Um, I was impressed, inspired, and I decided that I wanted to apply, which I did some months later. On New Year's Day in 2011, I found myself on the way, on my way to the field, to an MSF field. Um, I was on my way to Kenya to be the new logistics manager for an ongoing HIV tuberculosis project that MSF um, had in Kenya. So I can tell you that I, at this point, I had never been to Africa in my life. I'd never done anything medical in my life, and I was a little bit nervous. So I step off the plane, and the heat and humidity of um, sub-Saharan Africa just smacked me in the face. And I said, where am I? And so I was, let's see if this cord will make it. Uh, I was in Western Kenya in the Lake Victoria region, which is right about here. Um, <clears throat> this project was in a town called Homa Bay. It's, um, um, so Kenya and this part of East Africa is actually a fairly stable developing part of Africa. Um, but this region, just it just so happened that about 30% of the population was living with HIV. Um, and this had happened over the years mostly due to lack of education about the disease and lack of access to health care and drugs. So MSF, we started this project in 1999. Um, and we were one of the first aid organizations on the ground responding at the time to what was an HIV crisis. Um, by 2011, the situation was a little bit more under control. Um, we, uh, uh, thanks to advances in, in um, life-saving antiretroviral drugs and access, uh, people having access to healthcare of which MSF was, was one of the providers. So I worked in this hospital. Um, this is actually a government hospital in Kenya um, where MSF is working side by side with the um, Kenyan government. So basically we were responsible for all HIV and tuberculosis uh, healthcare in the hospital. Um, this was a HIV clinic that we had built in the hospital um, for treatment and education of HIV. We were also, oops. Yeah. Um, we also, sorry, I think this slides. Let, yeah, so we also ran this tuber uh, the tuberculosis ward in the hospital, um, which was, um, uh, we were treating about 200 people for tuberculosis. Um, tuber tuberculosis is a highly infectious disease, but it's easily treatable if people have access to drugs. Um, I was one of about six international staff um, with over 150 local national staff in the project. And this is fairly typical for an MSF project. Um, the national staff make up about 90% of all MSF healthcare workers on the ground worldwide. Um, and they're a key component to all MSF projects. They're usually um, kind of the, uh, you know, they speak the local languages, they understand the customs, they're really the link to the community um, that we're working with. And as a result, they're doing most of the consultations and education. Um, so yeah, these are some of our tuberculosis patients. We, as, as I mentioned, we were treating about 200 um, TB patients in this, in this facility. Um, the co-infection rate of our TB patients was about 99%, so that meant that um, virtually all of our TB patients were also HIV positive. We built this uh, laboratory, which at the time and still is today, one of the most sophisticated labs in the country for the treatment of HIV and tuberculosis. And so it, we were treating a lot of people. 
In fact, we had over 10,000 people on life-saving antiretroviral drugs. Um, HIV, if detected early enough and treated early enough, is actually relatively uh, easy and inexpensive to treat. So again, I was the logistics manager in this project. Um, <clears throat> so I was responsible for the daily runnings of, of kind of the project, which again is things like supply, procurement, power, water, construction, vehicles. I managed a team of about 30 guys, which included watchmen, drivers, mechanics, a storekeeper, um, some maintenance guys. Are you laughing at the shirt I'm wearing? These guys bought that for me and they thought it was pretty fu funny. Um, yeah. In Kenya, Mzungu is, is essentially a, a term for a white person. And, and, and so Mzungu, how are you, is, is something that all the kids will say to you all day long. And so that they bought this shirt. This was my going away party. They thought it was pretty funny. Um, <clears throat> anyway, we had a lot of construction projects um, uh, lined up for this year in this project, which was, which was pretty good for me because I came from a pretty strong construction background. And it's probably how I wound up being placed in this project. Doing construction in MSF essentially means that you are the architect, the engineer, the contractor, and the inspector all in one. Um, we also did a lot of outreach in this project. We were supporting about eight rural health uh, facilities with HIV TB work. Um, what you see here is a, is a pharmacy that we basically built out of a couple shipping containers. Um, and this is some of the creative problem solving that you typically see in the field that we do out there. Um, and it also kind of indicative that it, it you know, doesn't necessarily have to be pretty to be effective. Um, waste management's always a priority for us. Um, so this is one of the, this is a medical waste incinerator that we were building in one of these rural healthcare facilities. Um, this gentleman on the right, his, his name is George, he's one of our TB patients, and, and here we are actually supporting this family um, with building materials for them to build a second house on their uh, kind of little homestead. Um, this was because, because the entire family generally would live under one roof, and TB being a very infectious disease, um, this could be kind of dangerous for the rest of the family to be living with a family member that has TB. So we provided them with some materials to build a second house um, while he was um, in treatment. And I got to be a part of this amazing team, which um, again, the project is majority national staff. Um, and the, the staff here, they, they actually took a lot of pride and um, uh, passion um, for, for this project and what they were doing in their community. You can imagine with a 30% infection rate in the community that every single one of these people um, had friends or family that were affected by this epidemic. And yeah, if you can see that, that's Sasha Obama's face on the back of a bus. Um, it just so happened that this was the Luo region of Kenya where Barack Obama's father came from. His grandmother lived in a mud hut just about 30 miles away. Um, and incidentally, in the Luo tribe, uh, basically everyone's last name begins with the letter O which makes uh, filing all of this alphabetically <laughs> kind of humorous challenge. Um, so MSF is uh, still working in Kenya. We're still doing HIV work all over the world. Um, worldwide, we have about a quarter of a million HIV positive patients who receive life-saving drugs from an MSF uh, facility. So I was in Kenya for nine months. Um, I came home. Uh, at the end of my first mission, but I can tell you that now I was hooked and I wanted to go back. So I signed up um, for my second mission and they sent me to South Sudan. Now, Sudan, I'm going to point this out here. This is kind of Greater Sudan, which um, Greater Sudan uh, has a very long, complicated history. It's been going through about a 70 year armed conflict. Um, in 2011, South Sudan, highlighted in right there, in, in red, um, became an independent nation from the rest of Sudan. Um, at the time, there was renewed fighting in the southern part of what is now North Sudan, right about here, um, in uh, a region called the Nuba Mountains. Um, 
this fighting was uh, forcing people to flee their homes and flee south into the, into the brand new country of South Sudan. Uh, and there was a refugee camp forming on the border there, a uh, camp called Yida, which is right about there. Um, so I went there in January 2012. Uh, South Sudan was about six months old at this point as a country. Um, this was my second mission. I was going to be working as a, a logistician in this newly forming refugee camp, Yida. Um, I was there working with, uh, I was part of a team uh, called the Emergency Desk. Um, so this is kind of, Emergency Desk within MSF is kind of a specialized team um, designed to uh, uh, essentially equipped for rapid, large-scale response to any sort of crisis that might be unfolding in the world. Could be disease outbreak, natural disaster, armed conflict, um, or displaced people, as, as was the case here. So displaced people is, this is a big focus for MSF. Um, the people here were forced from their home due to armed conflict and bombing. Um, they fled their, their homes, their lives, their, their livelihoods, their crops. And in most cases, um, they arrived to Yida with, with only what they could carry on their back. And this they'd been walking for days at this point. Um, this, this here is an aerial shot of Yida in 2012 when it was about uh, 20,000 people. So we have a large influx of refugees coming into this camp. And MSF has the ability to um, respond very quickly and effectively uh, because of our independent funding. So what does that mean exactly? Uh, you might have some other organizations who are trying to respond to a situation like this, and they have to go look for funding. Um, they're writing grants. They're asking for money from governments or the UN or something like this. And this can all take um, a lot of time, valuable time. And quite often, there can be some sort of political agenda tied to the money. So virtually all of MSF's uh, funding comes from private donation, which gives us the flexibility to um, respond according to needs that we see on the ground and respond very quickly. And so what we saw on the ground was a camp that was quickly becoming overcrowded with limited access to latrines, showers, clean water, and health care. Um, and this, this is the perfect recipe for uh, disease within a population. What you see in this photo here, these are, these are people lining up to pump water from a shallow uh, well. So in response to these needs, um, MSF immediately began to set up this field hospital here. Um, <clears throat> in the capital, we have uh, what are called emergency preparation kits, or EPREP. Um, so these are things like tents and supplies and drugs that we can quickly deploy to, the, to any sort of field to respond to some sort of crisis, which in this case, as I mentioned, was displaced people. Um, this is an extremely remote region. Um, we had to set up and supply essentially everything. Um, this is a, the entire country is essentially a conflict zone, so um, there, was, there was no road access, so we had to fly in everything. Um, in this photo, we are unloading a small generator um, into the world's oldest pickup truck. Um, when you're flying all your supply around, um, you're constantly, you, you know, planes are kind of limited as to how much they can carry. Um, so there's this sort of weight priority game that you're constantly playing out there. Um, and so you, you, we try to make do as much as we can with local materials. And so this is, this is actually what we are living in. Um, so I lived in one of these kind of little grass units on the right there. Just simple grass structures that we built with local materials. Um, this was our initial pharmacy, which was also built from straw, sticks, and plastic sheeting. <clears throat> kind of quick setup, quick and dirty. This is actually a problem, though, because the daily temperatures were well into the 120s. And um, it, which is not a good environment for our drugs to be in. So we, we had to think about building a new pharmacy right away. And here's where the kind of the national staff suggested um, this sort of local solution. We can just, we can make clay bricks from the clay that's in the ground right underneath us. So that's great, let's do it. So these are, these are just sun-dried clay bricks. And we started to build this pharmacy. Um, uh, for our drugs. 
On the left, this woman here, her name is Severine. She was our French pharmacist, and she was so excited about her new pharmacy that she came out to help us for only one day. Um, <clears throat> we take security very seriously in MSF. Um, this, this is an active conflict area where we are working, so we built a number of these on the right. Those are foxholes, and this is kind of like a bomb bunker um, on the left. These are scattered throughout our hospital because there was a bombing risk from the Sudanese government. Um, so in, in addition to some measures like these on the ground, we're, we're constantly assessing the context around us and communicating to some of the different actors on the ground about who we are and what we're doing. So we're talking with kind of the, the government, military actors, civilians, you know, and, and constantly re reiterating to them that we are an independent, impartial, and neutral humanitarian actor. <clears throat> um, right, so we're, we're neutral. We don't take any sides. We're impartial. We'll treat anybody. And we're independent, so we're not affiliated with any governing body. Um, That bomb bunker I showed you was actually serving as our office. Um, and it was super dusty and dirty in there. And there was, there was kind of like termites living in the grass and the roof. And it was raining dirt down on top of us. And the one computer we had, the keyboard just got so full of dirt that the space bar stopped working. So every email has started with like, my space bar doesn't work. <laughs> Have you ever typed an email without a space bar? It makes you look real professional. Anyway, um, meanwhile, we were running, and we were running a basic, essentially a brace, basic primary health care hospital um, out there for simple things like um, vaccination. We were vaccinating children for measles, um, malaria, diarrhea, malnutrition, respiratory tract infections, um, all relatively simple and easy things to treat, but they can be life-threatening if they go untreated. Um, I like this photo. This, this kind of demonstrates uh, in MSF, the vast majority of our patients worldwide are women and children, about 70%. Um, we work in a lot of conflict zones and we work with a lot of displaced people, which tend to be women and children. And um, uh, most often they're not directly involved in these conflicts, but, but quite often some of the most greatly affected. So um, after months, of setting up this hospital in this, in this war-torn region in, um, in South Sudan, my mission was over, and I was on my way back to the capital of Juba. Um, so I'm on this small plane flying back to Juba, and sitting in the seat uh, across the aisle from me is this um, young boy. He's probably about eight years old, and he has um, a massive infection on his hand. He's missing half his hand, and there's this massive infection in his hand. Him and his father had walked for about a week to get to our hospital to try to treat this infection. Um, yeah, so a massive infection on, on essentially what was remaining of his hand, because um, he had been playing with an unexploded object, um, as you might see, kind of like on the right there, and blew off half his hand. Um, so on the right, that's a, that's a cluster bomb. It's essentially designed to open up as it falls through the atmosphere and rain hundreds of small bomblets or essentially grenades um, over, over a small region, um, kind of a locale. Quite often they don't deploy correctly. These are like old Soviet bombs. They don't, they don't work right and it'll just hit the ground and, and what you have on the ground are like shiny silver balls that are attractive to children. Um, and they play with them and they get killed and injured. And this happens a lot in South Sudan. So I'm sitting on the plane um, looking at this kid with like only half a hand. And I'm thinking to myself like, wow, like I've really lived a privileged life because I didn't grow up in war. And nor is my children growing up in war because you see his father had essentially been living in war his entire life also in this country. Um, I never had to wonder if our crops was going to be enough to feed our family the next year. I never had to collect water from a muddy puddle um, for my family to drink. You know, I'm thinking about these things because these are things that I actually saw while I was out there. And um, 
Now we were transferring this boy to the capital because he had come to our hospital with a week old, week old infection in his hand that we were unable to treat. And we were referring him to a different hospital in the capital where they were going to amputate his hand. Um, and like I said, this is kind of a common story in, in South Sudan. And I could tell you at that moment, seeing this kid, I was feeling grateful, not only for kind of the um, privileges that I've had in my life, um, but I was also grateful for MSF because I'm quite sure if we were not out there to treat and refer this boy, that this kid would have died from this infection. And ultimately he did lose his hand, but he lived. So, South Sudan is uh, one of the poorest, least developed nations in the country. Um, there's still an ongoing conflict uh, throughout, throughout this region. Um, in, it, it's one of our biggest missions every year. In the past few years, MSF has spent about $100 million for programming in South Sudan. And you can see here, these are projects that we have all over the country. And the reason we're working all over the country is because what I described to you is essentially happening all over the country. Um, <clears throat> so, and this was actually to be my first of three missions in South Sudan. And I went home, and I took a break, and then I was uh, ready to go back. After I had some water. Okay. So, in, um, how are we doing on time? In March of 2013, the conflict in Syria was entering its third year. MSF offered me my, um, my fourth mission <coughs> as the deputy logistics coordinator um, with, the, with the emergency desk uh, for its operations in northwest Syria. Um, this was in the Idlib province. Um, it's kind of like right here, the Idlib region. So just in that small region, in MSF, we were working all over the country, but the mission I was a part of was just there in Idlib. In that region alone, we were offering mental health care services for Syrian refugees in Turkey, um, water hygiene and sanitation programs for internally displaced people who were packed in camps on the Syrian-Turkey border. Um, we had primary health care programs running in some of these different camps. We had a huge outreach network where we were supporting a number of other non-MSF medical facilities. Um, and our two big projects in that area were two uh, trauma surgical units that specialized in severe burns. And again, that was all just in, in the Idlib area. Um, so yeah, I was, I, was kind, I was basically being brought in as a technical advisor. Um, some of the main things I was working on, I was essentially building an ambulance fleet from scratch and helping MSF to open um, one of these uh, burn units. Now, um, yeah. So we, MSF started in this region uh, doing trauma surgery. Um, we found there was a need for uh, burn management and burn care, so we kind of adapted to the needs and um, sort of shifted one of these trauma units into a burn unit and started to set up another one. Um, so burns is a very technical surgery. It requires a hyper-sterile environment, which is a difficult thing to achieve in a conflict area, but it's something that MSF is, is actually able to manage pretty well. Um, so it turns out I spent most of my mission actually working in one of these burn units. Um, I was based in Turkey for a while, and then I went across the border into Syria um, for a two-day visit to one of these burn units. And while I was there, I was asked if I could cover uh, a gap. They had a, a sort of a gap with their logistics manager who was not there. They didn't have one. And asked me if I could stay. And I said, yeah, sure, no problem. And my, my supervisor back in Turkey, he said, yeah, th that'll be great. It'll just be like a few days. We'll get somebody else there. I wound up being there for like two months. And I only had one pair of pants, <laughs> which were fortunately my favorite pair. So it's all good. Um, but this is the kind of flexibility they're looking for from uh, aid workers in the field. So, um, working in Syria was, was the most challenging thing that I've ever done. Um, 
and not just the challenges of being, of sort of working with this like highly technical surgical unit um, that was quite graphic at times, but uh, um, this is an incredibly fast paced context that was changing all the time. Um, many different military armed actors involved um, with a high level of risk involved in working in this area. So I'm gonna try to describe for you one day, one typical day of working in this uh, burn unit in Syria. So, and this, this, is, this is the burn unit here. We, we essentially converted somebody's very large house into a burn hospital. To the left of that door up the road, about 70 yards is the house where the um, international staff were living and there was about um, 12 to 15 of us at any given time. Um, Due to the security in the, in the area, we were only allowed to be in the hospital, the house, and this 70 yard stretch of road was the only place you were allowed to go. Okay, we couldn't just wander around town or anything. Um, certainly couldn't leave that area without approval from our project coordinator. Um, so with the exception of a few of us, the house, the hospital, and that 70 yards was all you saw the entire time you were there. So I wake up in the morning in the house and I'm walking the 70 yards down the road um, to the hospital. And I, there's like some older gentlemen in the community kind of sitting in the street having tea. And I would sit and hang out with these guys and have tea with them. Now my Arabic is very bad and, and their English is even worse somehow. And, um, um, but I'm kind of just like hanging out with them sort of getting an idea of how they're feeling and uh, just, in, in some ways, this is like collecting valuable information about how the community feels about what's going on right now. If they seem cool and calm, then things are basically cool and calm. Um, so this is some way that we, we maintain ties with the community while also trying to understand a bit of what's going on in the area around us. Um, so after tea with these guys, I would come down, go into the hospital. Now I'd sit and have tea with some of the watchmen and drivers. These guys do speak English, and again, we're kind of uh, sharing some security information with these guys, to get an understanding of what's going on in the area, in the town, how, th how they're feeling. Um, on this morning, they're, they're expressing some concern to me because two of our colleagues um, have not been seen for a few weeks. And uh, what was happening a lot in this region is that healthcare workers, uh, Healthcare uh, people were being detained and reportedly tortured and killed by the Syrian government who were working in healthcare structures in an opposition area, which is where we were working. Um, so they had gone to Damascus for some reason and it was thought that they were picked up. Um, and so they were expressing this concern to me and those guys actually were never heard from again. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, after I finished tea with these guys, I go upstairs where, um, and I have more tea, with our uh, project coordinator, kind of a brief meeting with our project coordinator, and this uh, uh, Syri Syrian colleague of ours, whose his job is essentially to cruise Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and stuff to, again, kind of understanding the context, collecting more information, and helping us to understand what's going on around us. Um, and yeah, more tea. I don't like tea. <laughs> I'm a coffee drinker. Um, so on this day, we have uh, six surgeries scheduled. Um, we, have, we have about 30 patients in this hospital. Um, most are civilians, but we do have some combatants as well. And again, we're an impartial actor, so we'll, we treat anybody. Um, on this day, the operating team has Im actually invited me to come in and sit in on one of these um, surgeries. So I said, sure. And, and I scrubbed and put on the gown and the booties and everything. and. Um, and I walk into the um, operating theater and there's an anesthetist, a surgeon, a couple nurses, and a gentleman on the table with third degree burns covering both of his legs. And so I had never actually witnessed a skin graft before and um, I, I, I lasted about 15 minutes uh, <laughs> before I decided I, you know, I think I better go check on the generator or something. Um, but the reality is it's, it's uh, we have a team in there in this OT that is tire tirelessly doing this all day, every day for our patients. Because it's not just like a one-time surgery. There's a, there's a surgery and then a lot of recovery, rehabilitation. They go back in for more surgery. It's multiple skin grafts over a long period of time to heal these people. 
and this is what they do um, all day, every day, in the middle of this, in this war. So, um, after lunch, I, uh, one of the referral ambulances arrives from one of these other health structures that we're supporting um, near the front line. They're bringing us a, a, a burn patient. Um, so after we carry this patient into the hospital, um, we offer some support to this ambulance and the structure where they're coming from. I, we kind of give them a bunch of drugs, some bandages and wraps and stuff like that. I fill his, his fuel tank um, for the driver. And he's kind of looking at me with this like pale, withered, distant look on his face, which kind of tells me how things are looking on the front. Um, so he thanks me and gets back in his bullet riddled ambulance and drives away. Um, at this point, I get a call from my assistant. He's telling me that our incinerator, very similar to the one I showed you before, um, in another part of town is broken into pieces. And this is because um, some guys with a 500 pound gun mounted on top of a truck, were, were, they were using it for target practice. Um, so I'm hearing this is like, okay, I, I guess we'll just have to build another one. Um, and I hang up the phone. And at this, at this point, the generator running the whole hospital just unexpectedly shuts off. And we have someone on the operating table and a number of patients on oxygen concentrators at this point. So this is something we have to figure out and fix right away. So as I'm leaving for the day, I witness, I witness our watchman um, kindly telling a couple soldiers that they um, must leave their guns and grenades checked at the door if they want to come in um, to visit one of their friends because MSF, we don't allow weapons into any of our health structures or vehicles. Um, so after dinner of um, camel meat and pasta, um, the international staff were all sitting around kind of tired playing cards but relatively cheerful. We suddenly get a, an emergency call from the hospital because a man has just arrived. Um, he's, uh, he's just arrived and he has third degree burns covering 90% of his body. Um, and he's conscious and talking to the doctor and asking them if he's gonna be okay and if he's gonna make it. And um, to be perfectly honest, all we could do for this guy it was make him as comfortable as possible and help him to contact his family. Because um, the reality is, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of amazing work out there and saving a lot of lives, but we just can't save them all. So I wake up the next morning and I'm thinking to myself, I need to call home. Because um, at this point, I had been in Syria for about six weeks. My parents still thought I was in Turkey. I didn't want them to worry, um, so I didn't tell them. But I, I decided I'm telling my mother today. So I, I called my mother and got her on the phone. I said, yeah, Mom, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in Syria. I've been in here for a number of weeks. And I'm working in this hospital. And um, you wouldn't believe the day I had yesterday. <clears throat> but... Um, I'm a part of this really amazing organization, Mom, and we, and this amazing team, and we are saving lives here. Like, we're saving lives. And there's a long pause on the other end of the line. And, and finally, my mother says, my goodness, Matthew, well, are you at least wearing your sunscreen? It's like, did, did you hear what I just <laughs> told you? And she, she couldn't even like process what I just, uh, where her son was at this point. So um, um, it's kind of amusing, but, but uh, you know, I, it, at the same time, it's, it's difficult. Uh, working in some of these contexts is really difficult um, for the people there and also for their families. Um, so four months of this was physically, mentally, emotionally and spiritually the most draining thing I had ever done. Um, I, I left, I went home um, for about a month. Uh, about a month later, MSF called me up and they asked me if I wanted to go back. 
And I said, absolutely. Because I knew that I was a part of this incredible organization that was doing life-saving work um, in this region, uh, really making a difference in the midst of this humanitarian catastrophe that was happening in Syria. And so at that point, I spent about a year working in and around the Syrian context uh, with the emergency desk. Uh, I was a part of primary health care and mental health care programs for Syrian refugees in uh, refugee camps in northern Iraq. Um, you have an entire generation of children at this point who have, who've like, grew up in this conflict. Um, and the, the mental health care needs alone are astronomical. Um, I was a part of an obstetric and maternity program for Syrian refugees in Jordan. I worked in a primary health care hospital for uh, Syrian refugees, um, also in Jordan, um, in a refugee camp in Jordan. And this camp was big. I mean, 150,000 people big. There's, there's currently over one and a half million refugees in Jordan, Syrian refugees in Jordan right now. Um, so, Syria. MSF is committed um, to Syria, and we're, uh, we've been working there essentially since the beginning of the war. We're still working there. In 2014, about six months after I was there, MSF decided that it was no longer safe to have international uh, staff working in Syria, and we pulled all the international staff out. But we are continuing and still continuing to run projects in Syria with all Syrian staff. And that um, burn unit that I described to you is still running to this day. Um, so yeah, after about a year of this, I took some much needed time off, and then I went back. In 2015, I was back in South Sudan um, for mission number seven. Let's see. Okay, so a few years prior, um, <clears throat> MSF had been running a primary health care and therapeutic feeding hospital uh, for malnutrition. Uh, we'd been running a hospital in an extremely remote conflict-riddled region uh, of Sudan. Um, we had to suspend activities because the Sudanese government bombed our hospital twice. Um, so, bec and because of this conflict, the the healthcare system in the entire region had had effectively completely stopped working. Um, so, I was uh, a part of a team in uh, uh, 2015. Uh, part of a team devising a plan of how we could go back into this region and, and uh, kind of restart this project, offering um, primary health care again uh, without the risk of getting bombed. Um, so this time the idea was not really like a big hospital, but instead a number of small outpatient clinics kind of scattered throughout the region. Um, so essentially I was... I was uh, um, to conduct a feasibility exploratory uh, mission in this region. Just to, we, had a, we had a plan and, and sort of conjured up in our heads, but kind of sent me to the ground to see if it would actually work. Um, so I was sent out there with a team of national staff who would serve as, as like my guides, my translators, my liaisons um, during this exploratory assessment. So I was on my way back to Yida, right? Remember my second mission? Um, the Explo, the exploratory mission, was to be based out of there. And the Yida refugee camp at this point had grown from 20,000 to about 60,000 people. Um, they even built a new terminal at the airport. All right. Um, the MSF hospital had grown from 20 beds to 70. Um, and after three years, the staff working in this hospital um, these local staff had now become some of the best healthcare workers in the region um, after three years of training and working with MSF. Um, so this hospital was to serve as a referral point for this, um, um, a referral point and training center for this kind of ex new extended program uh, we were looking to start. So um, this is Khaled. He was my guide, my translator um, for this uh, exploratory project. I want, I'm a good friend. I wound up working with him for a long time. And we hit the road. Um, this, this is what a highway looks like in uh, Sudan. Um, this is an extremely remote area. There's no electricity, no phones, um, and really no roads to speak of. 
Um, and we went and visited a number of these previously government-run health uh, structures in the region. Um, so there was formerly uh, sort of the former government healthcare staff were still kind of in the area and working, still working in some of these uh, health centers despite the fact that they hadn't been paid by the Sudanese government for four years. Um, and we, so we went and we talked to a lot of these people. They all told us the same thing. We have no drugs, we have no drugs, we have no drugs. Um, <clears throat> this hospital, you can actually see uh, some of these kind of holes on the side of the building. Those, those are shrapnel um, marks that had hit this building because this structure had, had also been targeted um, for bombing. This gentleman's house had been destroyed by a barrel bomb uh, thrown from an airplane. This is a, essentially a very crude kind of bomb built in a 55-gallon drum and rolled out of the back of a cargo plane. Um, and it's sort of indiscriminate bombing that just happens throughout this entire region to instill fear on the population. This guy did nothing to invoke this. It was just like, you know, they just drop kind of bombs on, on these people. So after one month of running around in this region, um, we came to the conclusion that we totally had a project here. Uh, there was health centers in place, um, but they had no drugs, they had no water. The, the region was kind of short on water. There was hand pumps uh, throughout the region, but about 60% of them were broken. Um, and there was no cars for referral. There was really just like no cars in this region at all um, for refer referring complicated cases. So I sort of drafted my report, and I told MSF that um, I'm ready, like I want to return to help open this project, you just let me know. And so about six months later, I returned, this is now March of 2016, returned to this war torn region to be a part of this team to open this new project. Um, and you can see we kind of arrived in the midst of a sandstorm that had enveloped the entire country. <clears throat> and we, um, we opened a number of these uh, public health care units in, in the region. These are just like um, outpatient clinics uh, for basic first-line treatment. Um, we moved some of our now highly trained staff from the Yida Hospital to some of these uh, rural health centers. Um, so now we have good trained staff and uh, drugs for treating um, kind of simple things. Sim very simple things that can be life-threatening if they go untreated. This is basic stuff like vaccinations, respiratory tract infections, diarrhea, uh, malaria, malnutrition. We also started a, uh, a shallow well hand pump repair program. Um, what you see on the right there, that's an India Mark II. It's a very simple, effective, rugged um, hand pump. And in my opinion, this is one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century. There's hundreds of millions of people around the world that get their water from one of those. Um, <clears throat> we also started the training center at the Yida Hospital. Um, so that the hospital was to serve as a hands-on um, learning facility for both MSF staff as well as non-MSF healthcare workers in the region. Um, because the idea is that someday we won't be there and we want to um, leave behind healthcare workers in a region that is in kind of dire need for them. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it's a very remote area. All of us, when we first got there, all of us were kind of crammed into one tent. Uh, many of us were sleeping outside because it was just too hot in that tent. Um, it was about 125 degrees daily, um, and I ate beans and rice for lunch and dinner over 100 days in a row, and I still can't eat beans and rice. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm good for life, I think. Um, and so, yeah, things were going great until the, the rains came. This is kind of seasonal uh, monsoon region, and this sort of stuff became part of our daily routine. You can kind of see on the right there, in front of that car, there's a tractor towing that car along. Well, any car basically had to have a tractor escort because it was guaranteed you were going to get stuck somewhere. So this is a, hi a highly logistically oriented um, project. Um, we're constantly moving drug supply and patients um, in this remote conflict area. Um, 
but yeah, we were determined to keep the drug supply going. Um, <clears throat> one day I was, I was with this crew and we got stuck in a river crossing. So I had never actually witnessed a flash flood before, um, but I can tell you it's a real thing. Because this happened in about 10 minutes. Um, and yeah, guess who got to make that phone call? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, it, it, no, unfortunately not really. It, it, ha it happened very, very quickly. Um, not like a wall of water, but instead it was just a very gradual, I calculated it was about one millimeter per second for 10 minutes, just slowly rising. Um, I debated whether to show you guys this or not, but the reality is, you know, working in the field can be really hard um, and accidents do happen. And um, um, I, could, I could be like a Toyota commercial because we actually pulled this thing out and got it running again and it is still working out there. Um, says something about the Toyota Land Cruiser. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I can't say enough about the national staff of this region. Um, <clears throat> these people here have literally been uh, living in war their entire life. And um, there was times that I was squatting in a foxhole, and you can feel the earth vibrating at my back from bombs that were hitting the ground just like a mile away. And I can tell you that that's, it, that's not an easy thing, but it's something that these people have been um, enduring their entire life. Um, and they keep like smiling and laughing and working hard. And um, so I felt like, why, why can't I? And this, um, so this photo here is, uh, um, this is a picture of some of the international staff involved with this project. And this really, can tell you uh, the diversity of an international team you can have out there. Um, from left to right, you have a woman from Nigeria, France, Kenya, Japan, Nepal. That's me from the US, woman from Australia, and another woman from Kenya. And the gentleman taking this photo is from South Korea. And this is kind of typical um, of an MSF, sort of the composition of an MSF team out there. And this is a group of people that didn't know each other at all before we got to the ground, um, sort of met each other out there, and, um, um, and you know, just immediately, like, we're, we're going to work together to make the world a better place. Okay. So, yeah. Um, on any given day, MSF is running about 450 projects in over 76 countries at this point. Um, and we have about 40,000 staff worldwide. And again, 90% of those are um, national staff from the different countries that we're working in. Um, this is a snapshot of just some of our 2018 medical activities. Um, I'm not going to run through all these numbers, but you can see there's like millions, uh, uh, over 11 million outpatient, outpatient consultations, millions of people vaccinated. I always like to point out the births. We have over 300,000 births. Um, and, and it's important to note that most of those births were actually uh, sort of complicated deliveries where um, potentially the life of the baby or the mother or both were at risk. Um, yeah. I also wanted to point out some of the other um, um, kind of activities we've, we've been involved with and sort of some of the highlights from 2018. Um, We've been working in, in Gaza for many, many years. In um, March of 2018, the Israeli army um, responded in force to the March uh, of return protests that were happening in Gaza. And they opened fire on a lot of, on, on hundreds of protesters. Um, we have surgical team, we have a number of surgical projects in Gaza and the teams were, were totally overwhelmed. I think during that protest, I read something like they treated, uh, conducted about 200 surgeries in like one or two days. And we did uh, th over 3,000 surgeries in Gaza in 2018, surgical interventions, um, compared to 400 from the previous year. Ebola. Um, <clears throat> Ebola is an extremely uh, deadly and infectious uh, viral hemorrhagic fever. 
Um, it can kill about 25 to 90% of the people who, who, who get infected. MSF has been involved in um, most Ebola outbreaks in uh, sort of the past few decades that have occurred, including the largest one ever that occurred, um, as you probably remember, 2014 through 16 in West Africa. We're currently responding to the second largest Ebola outbreak in the world, which is happening in the Democratic Republic of Congo right now. Um, so yeah, in 2018, we treated um, yeah, nearly 2,200 cases um, of Ebola and administered uh, an Ebola vaccine, about 135,000 vaccines. And this is kind of exciting. This, this is a new vaccine um, that sort of just appeared at the end of the previous outbreak and um, is, is now just starting to being used, but it's, it's actually showing a lot of promise and kind of exciting. Vaccination campaigns is something MSF does very well. It's very logistical. Um, so yeah, uh, Yemen, there's an ongoing, the ongoing war in Yemen. MSF has been working in Yemen for ma also many years. Um, as I sort of indicated uh, previously with Sudan, and this is very typical, Sudan, Syria, wherever, wherever you have a war, the, the kind of medical, whatever existing healthcare structure system that was in place basically stops working. In Yemen at the moment, over half the medical facilities are closed. Um, People also have a really hard time accessing whatever facilities are open um, because of snipers and mines and checkpoints and all these war kind of things that just keep people from getting to um, having access to healthcare facilities. <clears throat> so yeah, in 2018, MSF treated um, 16,000 war wounded in Yemen. Um, we also treated over 14,000 for malnutrition. Um, we conducted over 75,000 surgical interventions in Yemen and about um, 115,000 suspected cases of cholera. What else? 2018, migration and refugees. Um, as I mentioned before, displaced persons is a huge effort for MSF. Um, since 2012, the number of displaced persons projects that MSF has around the world has, has doubled. Um, the number of displaced globally right now is, is over 50 million, which is um, larger than the, the population of an average country in this world. Um, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know exactly, 55 million or something like this globally at the moment. It's a huge, huge problem. Um, so <clears throat> we've, uh, um, we've been working with Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. The Cox Bazar refugee camp this is currently the largest refugee camp in the world with about a million people in that camp alone. Um, these are, these are uh, Rohingya Muslims who are fleeing persecution for in Myanmar um, f into Bangladesh. Um, we've also been working with central uh, refugees in the Central American migration. Um, so these are uh, mostly people uh, sort of fleeing Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, um, who have, for various reasons, fleeing these different countries and exposed to abduction, rape, exploitation, torture um, along the route to the U.S. This is through Mexico. MSF, we have facilities all along this route where we're um, offering mental health care services as well as primary health care services. Um, <clears throat> Libya in the Mediterranean Sea, search and rescue. In 2018, MSF, we, we were still conducting search and rescue operations in the Mediterranean. So we literally had like boats out in the Mediterranean, hospital boats, um, kind of, uh, picking up refugees fleeing y Libya for Europe. Um, um, we did this for a number of years. Unfortunately, we had to stop this operation this past December due to um, increasing obstructions by the EU. In particular, Italy um, was no longer allowing uh, refugee boats and, and refugee aid boats uh, to dock at their ports. Um, and they decided to do this despite the uh, suspected 2,300 people that had drowned in the Mediterranean last year trying to make it, which, is, which has been an ongoing problem in the Mediterranean for um, the last years. 
and mental health care activities, which I touched on a bit um, through my talk. It's something that MSF, it's kind of exciting. We've, we've increased, uh, um, sort of an increased medical activity we've been offering over the years. Um, in 2018, MSF released a report on the on sort of mental health situation in, for refugees uh, living in camps. Um, we found alarming rates of mental health disorders and um, suicidal thoughts of refugees in a number of different camps where this um, study was conducted. Um, we're, we offer mental health care services to a number of different countries around the world, notably um, for Libyan refugees in Greece, um, uh, Sudanese, South Sudanese internally di displaced and refugees in South Sudan, migrants in Mexico, um, the Rohingya in Bangladesh, like I mentioned before. Yeah. <clears throat> we also have the access campaign. This is kind of uh, maybe less glamorous, but uh, I think it's one of the coolest things that MSF does. Um, it, Access campaign was started in 1999. It was the same year we were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, the mission of the Access campaign is basically to bring down barriers that keep people from getting treatment and access to treatment. Um, so we're we're really talking about like drugs and kind of taking on uh, pharmaceutical the pharmaceutical industry um, to advocate for uh, drugs to be available, affordable. Um, suitable for people that we care for in the regions we're, we're working in and ad adaptive to places where we work. Um, <clears throat> one of our current um, focuses within the Access Campaign is uh, on, with Johnson & Johnson. Um, Johnson & Johnson, they hold a patent for um, sort of a new, effective, less toxic, um, more up-to-date tuberculosis treatment. Um, it's it's effectively too expensive to use in um, um, for people in sort of resource poor settings. So th these people are still using kind of antiquated, old, more toxic um, medical treatment. So we're currently putting pressure on Johnson and Johnson to lower the cost of this drug for TB, which is something that has been treatable for decades. It's, it's, um, almost embarrassing that it still exists even. <clears throat> anyway, thank you guys. That's, that's the talk right there. And uh, feel free to check out our website. Thank you guys for having us back again this year. And appreciate it. And I'm, I'm more than happy to answer questions if people have any questions. Yeah. Oh yeah, we have we have a mic here. People want to come. Right. I'm good at repeating the question too, but it's. Uh, is MSF involved either directly in the uh, research and development of new drugs, for instance, the Ebola vaccine, or uh, indirectly um, in pushing international partners to develop drugs in specific directions based on the need uh, that you guys encounter? Right. Um, so, y did everyone get the question there? The answer is yes, and the access campaign is one way that we kind of pressure the pharmaceutical industry. We also, um, there's, they're technically like a separate organization that is, was um, I think created by MSF and heavily funded by MSF called the DOD Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, Initiative. that's it. Um, and so this, this is a, um, um, this is an organization, they are literally developing drugs uh, for neglected diseases, particularly diseases that exist um, kind of in Africa or places where um, there's no profit to be made from uh, developing drugs for you know, diseases that don't really exist in the developed world. So the pharmaceutical industry doesn't have much interest in, in doing it. Um, I'm trying to remember, there's a really interesting sort of story from this, I can't remember the name of the drug exactly, but some some pharmaceutical, so like sleeping, I think it was sleeping sickness, right? Um, has been going on, it's, it's existed in Sub-Saharan Africa forever. Um, the treatment is this super ancient, like you inject something in their bloodstream and the kids like, it feels like fire running through their entire body. No, no f company ever did any research to try to find a cure for this drug. And then one company accidentally discovered 
a um, that or one company developed a cure for this drug, but they didn't want to market it because there was no money to be made. Then they figured out that this drug is very effective, a topical version of this drug is very effective at removing unwanted facial hair um, off of women. And so then they started to develop it because, you know, the battle for upper lip hair will be won. But, you know, kids with sleeping sickness in West Africa, that's their problem, I guess. Yes, please. This is Stephen Figge. Yeah. We also do. Oh, is this on? We also do a lot of um, controlled testing, um, ethical, you know, medically ethical testing in our projects as well of new drugs, so that um, we can ch prove efficacy and, um, you know, we kind of get to the places where the patients are for certain certain diseases that don't really exist in the West, where the drugs are being made. So, we um, sort of help facilitate those tests. And I think even like this Ebola vaccine is an, an example of a, a new drug that's developed and we are an, an excellent organization to like, oh yeah, we could administer hundreds of thousands of those, no problem, that's what we do. It's new, it's kind of a new thing, yeah. We, we uh, you saw there, we have vaccinated 135,000 in DRC this year. Any other questions? How am I doing on time? Think we've, we've got time, yeah. Uh, first of all, I have to take off my hat off to you guys who go to these uh, countries, which I wouldn't go to because of the ongoing conflict and stuff like that, so hats off. Uh, on that note, though, I'm curious as to when you've been going in some of these particularly dangerous countries, especially in the Middle East, like Syria and something like that, have you ever felt like you and your team were in immediate danger from attack or not necessarily? I'm just I'm just genuinely curious. Uh -huh. have, ever, have I ever felt in danger? Yeah. <laughs> Immediate. I mean, um, there's two ways to answer this, and they're both kind of true. Um, it's, I mean, I would be lying if I told you I never felt nervous or scared or whatever out there because um, things are happening in these countries. Like, and I, I, for some reason, I worked in a lot of uh, conflict areas where there was bom bombings and armed fighters and people that would maybe kidnap us someday or and all kinds of weird things happening. Um, so that being said, I also, and I truly believe this, had a really strong um, um, faith in MSF as an organization. We do an incredible job of context analysis. There's people based in Europe and even uh, here in New York um, and different parts all over the world who just like, all they do is read the news and study context. We have university professors that kind of work with us that understand some of these different regions and contexts very well that kind of advise us. And so we're constantly, analyzing the context where we're working. We're constantly reaching out and talking to different armed groups and military actors. And um, one of the reasons that bad things don't happen to us that often, um, I mean, sometimes things happen, but um, our, our core principles of neutrality, impartiality, um, and independence, you know, because we're out there willing to treat anybody, we're everybody's friend. Right, so we don't take sides in a conflict. Quite often in a conflict, we're treating both sides or all sides or whatever. We kind of don't ask questions. We're just, you know, med basic medical ethics. Um, so yeah, as as a result, we um, typically that's kind of our protection. Yeah, uh, strength and strength and ethics, I guess, something like that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yes, I don't know, it, it sounds like we maybe need to wrap up soon or, okay, yeah, there's another event, but I'm um, downstairs. Yeah, if anybody has any other questions, I'm. Uh, right, so apparently we have a booth downstairs. Feel free to come uh, downstairs or you, you can just grab me in the hallway or whatever. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. We also have some, um, this is Steven, Jeremy, Leela, and was it? Mark, is, there he is. Um, so some other MSF representatives here, we're more than happy to talk to you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.